This is part 11 of the tutorial series on how to create a plane in Plane Maker. Uh, I'm back in Photoshop. Sorry, I couldn't handle GIMP. Uh, it's a free program. It's great. I just wanted to make you aware at least once in this series that you can actually use GIMP, that it's very usable. I just haven't configured it properly and I didn't want to go through that whole process. And it was also not my intention to create a GIMP tutorial. I think those are available on the web on different places. So basically I did similar stuff to what I did in, in GIMP here now in Photoshop. I actually spent some time on the windshield here and did some tweaks to it to make it look uh, correct. And in this tutorial I just want to mention a couple of important points while you're creating libraries or, or paint schemes for your plane. One point is you can use synthetic textures like what I showed you here in GIMP last time. Uh, that you use the paint bucket tool and you use paintbrush tools and all that stuff to actually create your paint scheme. And those paint schemes are hard to make them look realistic and real. But there's advantages to them. They have much more flexibility and usually there's more clarity to them. But you can also make libraries using actual photographs, real photographs. And I'll give you an example of that. Let me copy this. I actually straightened this photo out a little bit so that everything is lined up properly. I'm going to go back here and hit paste and move it into position. In Photoshop you hit command T or control T if you're on the PC and I usually like to put, a, put this anchor point somewhere where uh, when I resize the image it will rotate itself or resize itself around that point provided I hit the option key while I do that. See now my, my image is resizing itself around that anchor. So that makes it a lot easier to do the initial positioning of this image. I'll probably move it down with the arrow keys a little bit. There you go. And if I don't press the option key, or alt probably on the PC, I can resize it freely, get these parts of the image to line up uh, just the way I want them to. And this is the handy part about having this layer of synthetic texture because it really helps me line up the photographic texture later on. This could become our example of a photographic texture, provided we can overcome the difficulties that we face here, for example, the body being rounded and not having the ceiling line up properly. Here's an example of what I would do with this situation. And each situation is different, so it's worth learning a variety of techniques to overcome these issues. One technique is to take part of the body and just stretch it up there. And then you probably have to either blur out those things or uh, what I would do with this texture is probably just go ahead and delete everything that's white and then I could possibly do something similar to that here because I want to get rid of this wing part but this looks all pretty linear so I can just hit the option command shift key on the Mac and I think it's control alt shift on the PC make sure I'm in that layer and then start uh, moving the arrow key to the right to overwrite or copy everything that is part of the wing and then I can do the rest with this part here too. Just select this and move it further and further over. And of course I'll get some of these artifacts and I'll try to deal with them later by using filters like blur filters or smudge or those kinds of things. I'm going through real quick to show you how it is that you can actually make your own texture for your plane without having to do it all synthetically. And then I would take this part here, give it an initial forward movement like this. Once I have a little more data to work with, I would reselect it with a little more playroom and then hit the shift key to... the shift key basically gives me a little bit more distance per arrow click. Okay, so getting this cockpit to wrap around like the, uh, the templated version does, that's gonna require a lot of tweaking and a lot of work that uh, I'll have to figure out different techniques. I don't know off the top of my head what I would do with that. But if we just take a look at the rest of the body right now, we have something we can work with. For example, what would I do with this bottom part here, the, the part that has all these duplication artifacts? I would probably go to Filter and go to Blur and maybe Gaussian Blur and that'll blur it right out and it will help me to make the plane look more realistic. Maybe I can get away with doing that up here too. Let's try that. And once I've done that blur I can always reapply it just by going up there. Okay, that looks pretty decent. I think I can work with this. And now let's copy this to the other side of the body. And then I'll save it again. And then I hit refresh. Then here's the example of a photographic texture in the making. You get the idea though about all the tweaks that I have to go through to 
you know, get rid of those seams at the top and bottom to make the plane just look really, really slick. Uh, what I want to show you next is how you can make a folder structure and how you can swap paint schemes without always having to reapply a different PNG file to the 3D model here. So let's go back to Photoshop. I'll go back to the synthetic version of my paint scheme. Say I want to make one green library and one orange library. So I'm going to duplicate this layer and I'm going to go to Adjustment and I will go to Hue and Saturation and I will drag this hue slider over to where it's just about orange. That's too far. A little more yellowish maybe. And uh, a little more even. Yeah, I don't want to have it too green. And then you go saturation and lightness. That's too yellow for me. Let me go back to darker orange. There we go. Okay. Now I have the possibility of exporting an orange and a green paint scheme. But I want to keep my American Eagle paint scheme. So what do I do? Instead of exporting this file into the same directory that your ACF file is in, you can make some adjustments. You can create a new folder called Libraries, and you have to spell it with a capital L. And then in here you create the name of the library you want to. For example, this one would be called Orange. I create a new folder there and then in that folder I save the PNG file with the same name that the paint scheme, the original paint scheme has and I hit save. And then just to prove my point here I'm going to activate the green layer and do the same thing for the green one. But instead of saving it in the orange folder I'm going to go back up a level to till we're in the libraries folder, create a new folder called green and then save it in here. Now what did that just do? It allows me to switch now between the default, which is the American Eagle Paint Scheme we're working on, and now we can go to and select one of these other two libraries, the green one and the orange one. So there you go, that's how you create different libraries. And one more thing I want to show you about this process is that, for example, if we, if we take a close look at the default paint scheme, we see that there is some artifacting going on, some compression stuff that you get when you have uh, JPEGs or when you download uh, files from the internet. You see these, um, these squares here that form? That's because of compression of JPEG files. Ideally, you would want to have access to high quality raw files or bitmaps or something that is not compressed so that you can create nice uh, libraries, photographic libraries out of them. And the other thing you can do provided you have a high resolution original image that you can work with, you can create a library that is actually twice the size of the normal resolution. So normally you have files that are 1024 by 1024 and the simulator has been upgraded to version 9 where it can handle 2048 by 2048 files with relative ease. So you can go ahead and resize this project you're working on, say image size and go 2048 by 2048 and this new size will allow you to do a lot more detail. For example, if I now take this same image of the American Eagle, the canvas is now twice the size and a lot of the resolution that we had in the, in the original image will be preserved. So that is the advantage of working with higher resolution images. However, it slows the process down of working. It takes a lot longer to export the 2048 by 2048. I strongly encourage you to work with 2048 by 2048 images simply because the simulator can handle it and uh, the fact of the matter is it just looks that much better and it gives you that much more flexibility to work with these images. So you don't have nearly as much uh, compression and pixelation happening when you when you import the image at this resolution. So that's what I encourage you to do. I'm not going to finish this paint scheme just simply out of time's sake um, but you get the idea of how this works. You can find a labeled version of the paint scheme in the X-Plane folder under instructions. There's example plane and Here's the example paint schemes that you can look up as a reference to understand where what goes. See here's the nacelle, nacelle left, nacelle right, and it even gives you the, the, the places where the text has to be reversed, which is really handy. So in the next tutorial, I don't want to continue on with libraries. I think you've gotten the idea of how to make libraries. I want to move back to cockpit and instrument. So there was a couple of things that I left out for that tutorial, and I want to get back to that. Thanks for watching.